Hey, where's the intro? Yes. I am Ondo. I am your host. You gotta quit fucking around. As far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing. A way to sort of cause trouble. <laughs> Welcome to the Undergang Armchair. Bring it. Hello and welcome to episode 35 of the Undergang Armchair Podcast. I'm Ando, I'm your host of this very program, and I bid you welcome. I want to give an extra special welcome to all the new listeners. We see you out there poking around, starting to pay attention, and we really appreciate it. Come on in, join the party. For those of you who are new, this is a podcast in which I uh, yammer for a little while and then we sit down and talk to artists and hear what they have to say about their work and about their life. And they get a long format forum to discuss their ideas at length and, you know, anything else that might be going on. We, of course, have an excellent show for you today. We are joined by the talented and amazing Julie Nord. She was gracious enough to come in and join us. But uh, for you old listeners, I really, you know, the votes are still coming in on the intro. The intro music specifically. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it too much? Is it not enough? Jury's still out. It's actually about 50-50. So please keep the emails coming. Let us know. Is it appropriate, the intro music, or is it just too much? We want to know. You can email us, holler at undergang.net. So like I said, today's guest is Julie Nord. She has a show right now at Gamostan, which you should really go see. It's here in Copenhagen. It's an exhibition space. There'll be links to that up on our website, but we talk a little bit about the show and what it was like preparing it and ideas she has about curation. And that's just a good jump off point for everything. The theme for today is the secret room. And I'm understanding that as a tool for surviving and for making work you got to have some sort of space that's yours and that's untouched, that remains pristine and available when you need it. And it's, it's something like the, you know, some great painter once said, genius is childhood recalled at will. It, that, that can be your secret room, somewhere you can find what it is, what the core of what you're doing is, and be able to utilize that as a, as a person living in this modern world. On another short note, go see the David Shrigley piece at Nikolai Valner. It's up right now. Go there, and don't be a punk. Make a drawing. That's all I'm going to say. But go see it. It's good. All right. The Secret Room featuring Julie Nord. Enjoy the show. I went to New York in 2002, I think, and uh, I had the feeling the whole time I was there that New York crushes stronger people than me. You know, yeah. it's just that intense. Like, I, I couldn't. I mean, the only thing I really, you know, I liked New York. It was great to see a lot of art and museums and the whole vibe. But what I really liked was sort of go to the different areas. I stayed with a, a friend in in Harlem, and we sort of went around in that. That's a different New York. It is. And and maybe because we've been traveling so much sort of in the third world, I really like these sort of the international feel of it. I think was what I really like, but not I guess not so much what everybody else does going out clubbing and stuff, but but Yeah. Well, e- I mean e- eating a- e- eating plantains and, and street food somewhere in Harlem I thought was wonderful. Right. You well, know, I do so think the old And you New can't York. do that here, you know. It's sort of in that way I really liked it. But yeah. There's still more in Berlin as well, which is nice. So it's. Do you think it's, it's coming here? I think it kind of is. A little bit. If it's not getting too sort of posh, always. I don't know. Right, that's the big problem. <laughs> yeah. um, that you have to. Um, you know, they like oh street food, and then all of a sudden it costs a fortune, and you're like, and wait a second, that's a, not the point. It's biodynamic, and <laughs> it's the right people, and <laughs> I know. It's typical. Yeah. Um, all right, well, uh, I just wanted to uh, ask. I mean, you got your show up hanging right now. Yeah. You happy with it? Yeah, I am. Um, it's the second time I did this show, but it's quite different here because the rooms are so different, so I had to change it. The first time was in Aalborg, Kunsten, the museum there. Right, which I've heard good things about. 
Sorry? I've heard good things about Kunsten. Yeah, it's a great museum, great people, and sort of think very visionary place. And it's the, the architecture is, is quite challenging because it's alto and it's from the 70s, so it have this sort of 70s feel about it. And it's right, all long with, rooms with light and... from the top. How do you call that? On loose. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, lighting from the ceiling, yeah. ceiling lighting. Which is wonderful, but very difficult for most contemporary artists. If you do video installation, or like me, you want to make this sort of closed scenography looking like a home. So so I had to change it quite a lot, but, but I really liked the place. You do a lot of design when you make the show, right? I mean, you don't just have your pictures and they go on the wall. You design the space they're going to be shown if in. If possible, I prefer that, yeah, definitely. And and I think about when I do the works more and more, I actually think about how they're going to be, be shown, what colors on the wall and what lightning, and now I'm mm. working with sound as well. So, so you actually enter my work instead of just looking at a nice picture in a frame. What are you doing with sound? It's just very simple. I worked with um, with a sound engineer, I think you call him, called uh, Pelle Hvide, men med kameraet, and uh, a Danish composer, Hafdani, just to make some very simple sound. We started out doing it very complicated. I wanted you to walk into this sort of doll's house, this pretending to be a home place. So I wanted to have some sound that, that was sort of homely. Okay. Like one room is a dinner table. Very sort of bellman feeling with a um, mom and a dad and a child hanging on the wall in pictures. And there's this old magnet table. And when you go close to the table, you can hear they're eating. You can hear sort of knife and forks it's very, on very the plate, little. but there's no speaking. So it's this very sort of Creepy. uncozy uh, <laughs> dinner yeah. where we're eating, but we have nothing to, t- 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 to say to each other. So you have this sound in another room. There is a fly trying to get out. Uh which is sort of just buzzing where around. we're used to space where it's sort of buzzing around mm. and there's um, what do you call it spilldoser spilldoser yeah well, which, when children are going to sleep sometimes you have this machine oh, where you pull, pull a string and they play this Brahms l- lullaby so right, Fisher Price made them in the right, 70s right right you just pull the handle down and it exactly goes, ding, 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 ding. and, and yeah. I'm trying to work with sounds that everybody knows very very right. well and then to, to have them in the room to to Give that feeling of space when you walk around. So you, you get one of the persons in this, that home, actually, when you walk on a certain carpet and you hear the sound. So you, you, you get, I think, invited more into my work than if you look at a picture and maybe ask the price. Right. You know, it's, it's very different. Well, it could also feeling. help you pull out of whatever world you're coming from. Because, mm-hmm. exactly. you know, in my daily day, I don't hear children lullabies no. very often. No. You know? And that would maybe kind of bring back that emotional feeling of... Sure, I'm working very much with, with memories and, and emotions, and I think sounds are just fantastic to bring out that. Smells would be as well, but mm. that is maybe sort of overloading it. Right, that would be the future when you start having... Exactly. I guess some people probably do do <laughs> that already. A heavy smell of cabbage in the <laughs> dining room. We thought about it. I thought about it, but I don't know how to do it. And it's always, I think, a balance between making it to uh, amusement park. Like it's, there should be something which is empty where people have to fill in their own imagination. If I just totally. overload with sounds and light and and smells, there'll be no space left for your own imagination. Right, and you memory. don't want to distract from the works too no, much. No, no, either. no. It should be sort of a fine balance. Yeah, I mean, as a framer, I'm very aware of the of that weird balance that sometimes mm. the frames shouldn't really talk too no, much because no. the work needs to talk you know and other times the frame becomes a part of the piece and you know mm. I think I think ideas of presentation are really important it used to be that you just painted a picture and then it was done mm. and wherever it ended up that yeah. was you know that was just the fate of that picture you yeah. know but now yeah. it's more really it's I think it's important especially for young artists to pay attention to where yeah. is it hanging how is it hanging yeah. how is the lighting you know yeah. all that sort of yeah. stuff and, it, and like you say it can really help direct the viewer into I guess it's, it's all started for me because I started to do sort of only drawings in around 2001 after working with video and paintings and installation I sort of got pretty confused and I just took a pen and a piece of paper and thought okay now I have to find out what I want to say instead of how I can say it because right. you can say it in so many ways so it was kind of a dogma where I just had this quite small piece of paper and the same pen and I gave myself a year saying okay this is it if you can work with this 
try to figure out what what what's inside, what you really want to say, why you particularly you should do art, then fine. So it was really, really deliberating actually. Because there was no noise. I really good. had to have the silence to, to actually find out what, what am I thinking? What do I think I can contribute with in this art scene where there's everything and I get so confused and right. also I think um, fascinated by a lot of art, which is good, but I think sort of I had to move to this remote island mentally to, to actually find out. I think that would what, benefit what a I lot of people. Do. Maybe, yeah. You know, just because you do get confused and caught up and... You do. I mean, it's all individual, of course. Yeah. But what, what then happened was I really went into drawings, but when you put a drawing in a white cube gallery or a museum, it just suddenly somehow disappears. You just can't compete with big video installations or huge, big masculine <laughs> paintings, and you have this little, little drawing, which is... I think it's the intimacy of drawing really, really fascinates me, and I like it. So I tried to sort of incorporate that intimacy in the way of showing. Yeah. Instead of having this, yeah, like very posh gallery space, I tried to like here make a home and other places just make smaller rooms and maybe a carpet on the floor so you go quite kind of silent when you go in. And I think that affect the way you you enter the drawing. Is that one of the reasons you chose to work with V1? Because their exhibition space is kind of less. It's quite posh. difficult. I think no, it's not that. I think. To be honest, I think gallery spaces are difficult because the first time you exhibit is a new space, and you I can, think galleries you can, are difficult in you general. Can, exactly, <laughs> you can enter a gallery space, I think, one time, but continue to make exhibitions in the same gallery space, I think, is really, really hard. Yeah. Unless you just say, okay, I do this, I try to sell something, and then I work for a bigger, maybe, museum's exhibition or something else where you can. I think take in the room in a different way, and that is quite important for me. To, right. to use the room and well like you say you know the first time is the best time in terms yeah. of getting ideas I and think how to so. interact yeah. with the space I guess uh, you grew up in in Copenhagen is that right? partly until I was nine and then I moved with my mother to the countryside sort of a fisherman's village called Lemvi at the west coast quite a different is that in Jutland? Jutland yes very much okay <laughs> That was a shock, huh? It was, yeah. Yeah, I actually think it would have been maybe way easier if we moved to Nairobi and I went to <laughs> international school because then they would, you know, somehow be prepared. Right. That it was so different because it really was. Yeah. Right. And I don't, you know, I'm not one of those people who thinks Jutland is terrible, but it does have its advantages and disadvantages. My family is from Jutland. Yeah. yeah. No, I think maybe if you bought grown up there, maybe, not always it can be fine, there's a lot of space and beautiful nature and you can grow up with a garden and all that kind of things, but being nine years old, coming from we lived in Birgerød, where I went to a very sort of modern folkeskole public school, where we have all these 70s ideas, we made theatre, and if you're really bad at math it didn't matter, you could just put up your own play which right. I did Sounds and like then, my education. And then coming to sort of a very traditional old-fashioned public school in Limby, where we actually had prayers in the morning and wow. had to learn sentences from the Bible. And it was like going 100 years back. Did that really affect you? I did. It was really weird because I had to some, somehow make a secret of everything I was. And I think all my creat creativity, I just couldn't use it. We actually got sort of told off if we used too much imagination when we were writing in Danish and stuff. So you made a little box I think inside I made a little box, definitely, and saved it definitely, for later. Definitely. Did you spend your teenage years there too? Until I was 15 and then I went to a boarding school, which was great because that was sort of young people from all over the country and it was really fun and I was happy to be there and happy to get away, to be honest. Right. Yeah. So you just knew that, fuck, I got to get out I of did. here. I did, definitely. definitely. <laughs> it's, it actually seems to be coming up a lot with the guests I talked to. I think so. I met plenty. But I'm sure these years, too, somehow shaped me. Because they know. were, in many ways, lonely. Of course, I met friends, too. Which, uh, not of course, but I did. But they were somehow out outsiders as well. Mm. So it definitely gave you a lot of time to think. <laughs> now, Jutland um, is, is... One of the advantages of Jutland is that it is... In a way, you may disagree with me, I think it is friendlier in that way that country places are. People say hi on the street. Mm. People will help you if you need help. I mean, God help you if you're gay or different, then they won't be so friendly. But, but you know, just there's more of a community feeling. You're out here in the middle of nowhere, we only got each other. 
you know, things were so funny because I didn't think it was very friendly, to be honest. We were very different. I came from this uh, academical family. My mother is a teacher in high school in Latin and all right. Greek. And, and we were sort of very um, left-wing family. And, and we lived sort of very... Um, the way we, we had our house was my stepfather built his own table and it's supposed to look sort of really rough and <laughs> uh, flashing money was really bad taste. We all walked in the same kind of sort of East Germany clothes because that was cool. So it was Right, communism uh, uh, light. Exactly. And the families there, they were wearing fur and having the first solariums and video. And so it was so different. I was so embarrassed to have the kids home. But at the same time, uh, my best friend was different too. She came from a very um, religious family. Mm. And I think she was a bit of an outsider as well. And somehow her family really took me in, even though they must have thought I was, I don't know, ch ch children the of the devil. Spawn. My family was divorced <laughs> and I was swearing and right. I was you know, a very boyish girl at that time. Yeah. But they were sort of really friendly, actually. So, yeah. so it was very mixed. Right. Yeah. But do you think that this idea, like the families you saw there... I mean, you obviously have a lot of interest in family. Mm -hmm. Do you think your time there kind of influenced this idea? I mean, I think in a lot of those kind of places, family, the, 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 the image you project of family mm -hmm. is very important. We oh, hold together, yeah, yeah. Our, look at our living room, it's ready oh, for yeah. coffee and yeah, cake, yeah. here we go. You know, did that sort of thing, do you think that affected you? I'm sure sort of all these sort of nice houses and nice gardens and everything looks perfect on the outside, definitely, because I thought there was a lot of lies. Even then? Yes, very much, because mm. everything looked so neat, and to be honest, the kids were so cruel to each other. And uh, there were so many stories coming from downside, I mean, suicide and murders, and it was, it was really crazy, and, and everything just looked so neat, and this city had this room of being so neat, and tourists came and thought this was sort of heaven, so heaven on right? earth, you know, it was very sort of Twin Peaks in right. many ways. Right. Um, but of course it's everywhere and I think when you're a child and you get moved from something you know to something which just appears to be so totally different, you just lose um, you lose control and you have this feeling of the carpet being removed under you. And I think that feeling has somehow followed me and, and I also think it's very interesting because it makes you stand a little bit outside. I was definitely a voyeur, I was looking at these people, pretending I was one of them, but at the same time I never felt right. one of them. And I, I think I use the same thing here, because it's not that different, it's just different. Maybe we eat ecolog ecological food and put our kids to private schools and think the right thing, but there's always, there's always a lie, and I'm not necessarily criticizing the lie but but this sort of questioning what reality is and what kind of reality we want to pretend right we have and that that sort of interests me the reality and and trying to shake it a bit and i right. think families are a very good place because that's where it all starts somebody tells you who you are and what your name is yeah i think that pretending is actually it's one of those things as i get older i have to constantly remind myself not to do because mm. you get kind of caught up and like you go over to dinner at somebody's house and everything looks so nice and then when you have them over for dinner well you should probably make it nice too you know even though for me that's not at all what it's like to connect to somebody no right or to really be together no what if my house is trashed so what you know we're still I talking i think that's really scary being older that if you don't take care you suddenly go into this thing where you actually don't have the energy to invite friends because you think you should make a dinner and clean up the house right and like 15 years ago we couldn't care less we bought a pizza and we're sitting in, right. so in the trash together. That's the point. and i think that's really important to sort of stay with that tune mm. to be honest yeah it's a the, um, one the lucky thing about my growing up in my family they were always kind of like well you come here and that's this is what it's like today yeah, you know but we're here to hang out it's always nicer to visit people when it's like that anyway. no totally and you're like oh all right you're real yeah. people too yeah that's good exactly. um did you draw when you were in Lumbee? yeah i did i think it started there i was especially i think in the first couple of years i was really quite lonely mm. and as a, growing up as a only child too i had a lot of time mm -hmm. i was reading a lot sort of I think the library in Limby was, I think I read almost everything. Right. <laughs> Cartoons especially, but later books and later sort of adult books as well. Right. Uh, and then I was drawing. You should have a show at the library in Limby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I was, yeah, I was drawing a lot. And I think quite quickly it was sort of the only thing where I was 
quite good. Right. <laughs> so, so maybe that too, I guess, fueled it a bit. Was your dad back in Copenhagen? No, he was in Aarhus at that okay. time. I saw him every third weekend or something okay. and in the holidays. Didn't you get a feeling of like, oh, this is a city. There's actually other people here. Like, did you think, oh, I'd rather live here or... No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, don't, I don't recall I thought that. Mm. That was just where Dad lived. Yeah, I yeah. think so. What? Yeah, and, and I mean, it's, it might sound like it was all terrible. It wasn't. I mean, as a child, you're really quick at adopt. Mm-hmm. Sort of a, after a while, it was fine. I found this sort of hippie kind of theater for all the, the strange people who moved to the city. And I was horse riding, and I had this bird. <laughs> and, you know, I, I got along and got a few friends that were... Really There's nice always people, a way so. to make it work, exactly. I guess. Exactly. So when you went to boarding school, is that when everything opened up, though? Yeah, it did pretty much. I think also at that age I was 15 and I needed to to go away from my mom and, and right. do something different. And, and it was just great because I think also boarding school, you, you can't really pretend you're somebody for, for maybe, maybe for a week you can do it and then it all falls down. So it was a really nice way to be together with other young people. Did you start taking art classes there? They didn't have that much, but they did a bit, and, and when we had, sort of, yeah, I did a lot of drawings and made a newspaper, drawings for the newspaper for the boarding school and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you go to, to high school afterwards, gymnasium? No, I was supposed to go to the, what we call HOIF, which is sort of a, a shorter way of doing it. Yeah. My mother is a high school teacher, and I thought she cleverly enough thought at that I wouldn't. School's not I wouldn't. There. I wouldn't really do it. I was really tired of school and yeah. and wanted to do something else. And I did three months of this if where you actually get sort of. Uh, you get a degree. You get a, you uh, get a diploma. Degree. But after three three months, I actually quit. So, so what did you want to do instead? I wanted to be an artist. I didn't, you knew it. I didn't, you knew it. That was. I it. didn't really know what it was. <laughs> well, thank God. I mean, yeah, thank God. Knows yeah, what it sure. Is, My mother was, of course, terrified, but. <laughs> At that time, I moved to Aarhus, and I lived in a sort of small room together with other young people who were all mm-hmm. club bells. How do you call that? I don't know. What sort is of that? cheap. It's like a big apartment where 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 somebody's renting out rooms. Oh, so it's almost a collective, almost. Yes, yeah, some some. Well, right. I think we were ten young people living right. you, in you, small everyone rooms. Everyone has a room and, and one a, kitchen. One it's big terrible. party for a year. <laughs> and it was sort of really crazy young yeah. people. Most of them came from Copenhagen, needed to have a break, so it was. A very, very sort of creative environment. Yeah. And we did a lot of funny things and crazy parties and people were... It's it was fun, just really deliberating after coming from from a small town. Right. It's a lot of fun. You don't get a lot of work done, but no. you do learn something about socializing and just the energy. And everybody wanted to be an artist at that time, especially right. in that sort of... And so did I, mm. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So I just gave back my books at this... Or if sort of the kind of high school I went to and thought, well, I want to be an artist. I guess, so, though, also that's a good way of being alternative. When you don't know what to do, mm, you can mm. say you want to be an artist. Yeah, you know, you're like, yeah. this isn't working, so what else do I have? But I think quite early I, I thought I would do something with my drawings because I really like to do it. and But I just didn't know what. There's no artist in my family. And, and in my view, art was either something very very high class, like going to Louisiana and watch Picasso and I just couldn't identify with that at all. Or at the West Coast in Jutland, it was sort of older women making uh, oil, 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 oil paintings of the sea or <laughs> right. blue ceramics and, and, and that was sort of very far out for me as well. My very crafty. Yeah, exactly. Well, so when did you start? Like, where did where did you turn the, the, the corner and start really seriously working? I went to uh, high school. Yeah. It's hot- hard to explain because it's yeah, a Danish it's, it's, concept. It's, it's it's the best way to shortly say it is it's education for the sake of education. Mm-hmm. There's no final plan. There's no. It's for betterment of self. Essentially. Yeah, it was four months I think in Hotbig, a city like one hour away from Copenhagen, where I think there were eighty young people living there, and then you could you had education in poetry and in uh, sculpture and so movie an art, art. and also philosophy and so it's just you had this possibility to learn and there was nobody controlling you you didn't have to get a degree and it was I thought it was really fantastic I remember working so late at night with other people who were sort of burning for this thing and also I we saw a lot of contemporary art and I didn't see 
much until then and it was really right. mind blowing for me to watch Paul McCarthy videos and and suddenly I could relate to art as something else than uh, sort of high class people going to Louisiana or right. Miss Juliet, something very local. Well, that's where teachers are really important. And it related to, to my own life and to MTV and to everything I saw and, and was surrounded about. And I think I always had this urge to, to produce something, to be creative. And, and it was it was really great right, to be Right, it opened there. that mm. possibility yeah. in a way. Yeah. You could see that world. Yeah, that art doesn't have to be distant from yourself right, and your right. life and your, your time, the time you live in. Right. Mm. Did you then immediately apply to the art academy? And yes, in? I did. I did some really, really bad artwork. And, <laughs> and I, did, I, did, I didn't get in. Yeah. And I was really disappointed because I thought, I hoped I was just this sort of born to be genius person. And I wasn't, which was, I think, really, really good because I, then I had two or three years where I worked and traveled. Rejection can be so Travelling have been sort of really, really important for me, I think, to, to just figure out who I am and, mm. and what I think art is about. Mm. So that was, I think, very lucky. And then when I was 23, I was working really hard to apply and did some work that was way more sort of focused, and, and I was lucky to get in, which was a good time. Yeah, I think rejection can be such an important mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. Because I got in, I actually... I got in the back door to art school in the beginning, and I don't think it was till I was later in my twenties that I started getting rejected. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I probably I probably should have been rejected earlier because you start criticizing uh, at first you're upset, but then you start actually looking at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. How can I make this better? Mm -hmm. How can I be more focused? You know, and that can really help mm -hmm. you develop. You know. Yeah, I also think this whole idea that you, I think a lot of people, young people, have at least that's what I experience when I teach sometimes that art is something you, I don't know, born with, this genius thought, and you actually don't have to work that hard. Right. You just have to do something <laughs> on a paper or say a sentence right. and everybody will right. will love you. And, and, and it is pretty much hard work, and you just have to like this hard work, or you should do something else. You should really right. like to do the stuff more than everything else, because you don't know. Right. You might be popular one year, and then three years later, nobody wants to watch you. So, so I think you really have to love working. Right. And it learns you that uh, it's not that easy to be loved. You you just have to love it yourself. <laughs> because, well, that's um, that weird balance you have to hit, yeah, you know, because yeah. you have to both love what you do enough to keep doing it, mm -hmm. but also be critical enough to make mm -hmm. it better. Yeah, sure. You know, and if sure, you go sure. too much in either direction, that's you're going to fuck things yeah, up. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, so you went to art school. We all we all know about art school. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's good and it's bad. Mm -hmm. It's a great space to work in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, hopefully there's a couple of good teachers that help. Mm -hmm. shape you you know but one of the things I was interested in was the traveling you did you went to Africa a lot you went to uh, yeah, Asia a lot Africa quite a lot and Asia India yeah just around but I think I really like to sort of get lost <laughs> mm -hmm. to not go to sort of big capitals and cultural cities but but go to somewhere no Paris no New York. nobody knew about that it was forgotten in the lonely planet books to I really love to get lost at that, those years to see something else and to I don't know was that a way of disappearing yeah I think so and disconnecting yeah probably probably hmm. it's really hard to say what it was but it gave me a lot I think I just think it changed your perspective of, on things very much. It's quite a cliche, but it really do. If, if, you're, sure. if you are in a reality that are so different and where everything you come from and all the way you, you use to navigate, you can just you can just throw them away because it, it doesn't function. You, you see things in a different way. Especially and living it, in a country sort of, like Denmark. Yeah. And, and, and it was really important for me, and I really like to sort of be in some... Be sorry, I put in the middle of the night not knowing what to do and then just survive, really. I think it was yeah. sort of a very basic thing I was looking for. Right. Um, well, I'm starting to see a theme. You know, you, you decided at a certain point mm. uh, to only draw, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was a way of, you know, in a mm -hmm. way of disconnecting again mm -hmm. and being mm -hmm. lost and mm -hmm. just surviving. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with the travels. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it goes back to ending up in, in, in that little town in Jutland. Yeah, I guess, it, I don't know if it's the same with sort of Vietnam veterans that you should, <laughs> you, you keep on searching this PTSD. this PTSD place where all your nerves are just out and then you have to sort of 
how do I get out of this without getting a machine on my throat? Right. It's getting so very basic. <laughs> no, no, no. No, to be honest, I had some years where I was really sick of the art world and I was really sick of all the crap and talk and wanting to be famous and, and, I, and I really needed sort of the essence of things. And it's very romantic when I look at it today, but I was young too. I saw this exhibition at Louisiana when I was even younger about sort of traditional African art mm. or crafts or what, whatever you call it. And it just really blew me away. I thought there was this sort of intense energy in the works. That for me was quite a contrast to their own collection, which is very neat and expensive. And I, I, so, so I just knew I had to go. I didn't know why, but I really had to go and see where mm. this came from, what yeah. kind of source. So that was what drove me in the first place. Um, Did you engage with art when you were there, or were you just traveling? I was traveling, and and, and the art scene was was difficult because. Um, because it was very sort of inspired by Western art. So you see a piece of Picasso which is inspired of native African art and then you go to Africa and you see a piece of African art which is inspired by Picasso. Right. So it gets kind of... But, but the sort of the, the, the religion was, was... I was very fascinated about that for a while and went to West Africa too with a colleague and girlfriend and had that, that time to actually try to to find all these sort of voodoo priests and see what they did because I thought the Elsas was really, really beautiful and fascinating and all the systems they're built from I thought was really fascinating mm -hmm. even though I didn't know what they mean. Mm -hmm. But I think the importance of creating something behind it was was very intriguing for me where here I think a lot of the time people just did art to, to be famous or to look something but when I went there I saw a piece which was not named art, but maybe an ulcer, but you could see, you could sort of sense the importance of this object. Right, and that's what art comes from in a lot of ways. Like exactly. Kind of originally. And that it, it isn't disconnected from life, it is life. Yeah. You know, and it's ritual and it's magic. I, and Actually, I think that was what I was sort of looking for. I had to do it to balance the other things, because of course I looked at flash art and art form and tried to figure out what was what was smart and what was not, and I would like to be popular as well, but I had mm -hmm. to just escape now and then to to a different reality and a different approach on yeah. creating. Did you pay attention to family life when you were there? And how it was different than family life? In Africa? Life? Yeah, for example. Yeah, it's, it's just different. I mean, I'm not romantic at all. It's really hard because people are dying much easier, and mm -hmm. so it's not... I mean, I'm not into this, they're very happy people because their life are so basic, they survive in a different way. Right. I mean, right. I, I, wouldn't like swap. I, I was lucky I could go back to to my shower and my doctor, and yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's not, um, that is that weird I don't thing. think they're happier people, yeah. even though they dance more, I mean, it's not like that. They're just people. They're just people. My, uh, my parents met in Africa and uh, mm -hmm. lived there for several years, All right. and... Um, my mom kept talking about when she would come back to, mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the U.S., mm -hmm. she would walk into supermarkets and be like, what the fuck is this? You know, it was really hard to come back to Western life. Very hard. I think that, that shaped me pretty much artistically as well, because I, I think I've been in Africa altogether for one and a half or two years, mm -hmm. sort of spread over a certain amount of years. But coming back always was the hardest thing, and exactly coming back to the supermarket was just disgusting. Right, all this food packaged. And watching and TV presented. coming back, seeing all these sort of crappy TV shows, <laughs> I, it was sort of it was really scary to be honest. I was, yeah. and I think that shaped my art a lot. In the beginning, from when I went to this high school, I was very fascinated of art actually looking like traditional African art, sort of very earthy colors and. Mm extremely different from what I do now but coming back changed my whole sort of perception of art and I got very much into pop art and and art taking sort of um, offspring in in, in um, consumer culture actually. Mm. Was that a, like a you, kind of a kickback uh, you trying to fight not fight against but react to yes to the absurdity concept. of this world and then what we navigate from and right yeah, I think so. Well, reality is consumerism been a and lot. yeah, all the artificiality and wanting for fame and you know it's very yeah, it's not that. Yeah. Mm. Did you start working immediately after uh, graduating 
as an artist or did you have to take some shit job with someone? I had or? to take some shit job. When I was in the art academy, I was not very good at sort of networking mm -hmm. and I was really confused for most of the years and, as I said, running away all the time to right. distant places in right. the world. Uh, so when I was finished, I, I had nothing. I had almost nothing on my CV and I didn't have this sort of good network with people who was active exhibiting, so I actually thought that was it. That's it, it's over. <laughs> I did. I actually, I gave, gave it all up and I tried to make a children's book instead. I thought, okay, I could use my drawing to make illustrations. Uh -huh. So I sent this book for a lot of publishers and got it back saying, we, I'm sorry, we get so many books sent in and we can only take the most talented people, so... Rejection so, again. So it was a rejection, so I actually thought, uh, I didn't really know what to do. Um, Such but the, but crazy feeling. It is. But I kept on doing my drawings, and that was what I showed at the exit exhibition as well. And when I came out, I um, I had this job at the, at a, at the post, the Danish post. Uh, classic. Writing down sort of post numbers on a computer four times every day. And it was really depressing, especially because most of the other people working were women in the 40s, and they were all artists. <laughs> I was like, oh thinking, my, Fuck, that's my God! I remember crying at the toilet. I right. was really, really, after like six Life years at the Royal Academy. Yeah. Brutal. Mm -hmm. Brutal, but again, that goes back to that idea of rejection to make you stronger. You know, because at that point, you either give up. I was really shy, or... actually. I was really bad at selling myself. I was really bad at networking, and... And and during my time at the academy, I almost had some sort of how do you call it um, social phobia. Mm -hmm. I was really scared to mm -hmm. go to exhibitions and and openings, and and I got sort of more and more isolated, yeah. um, paranoid probably too. I think a lot of artists are very paranoid <laughs> at certain times, right. thinking what people that people think about me. What they exactly, think about what I and it just went crazy. But but have, actually having to work and working with all these women who, who sort of gave up more and more and then they got children and they had to take more hours at the post and maybe had an exhibition every second year, some Kunstvereinigung sort of small place or the dentist, which is okay, but that was just not what I wanted. It's not going to help the career. I really felt I had um, put myself down and all my dreams I had as a child and also this is not happening. And so I actually put myself together and got the phone and called people who I, I had contact with before who had showed just slight interest in my work. What kind of people? Like when I stopped at the academy, we had this sensor in, which was the the director at Aarhus Kunstmuseum, which is now ours at that time. He's, yeah. he's not there anymore. And he was just quite interested in what I did and thought it was nice. And I didn't know if he just said it to be nice, but I actually picked up the phone and called him and said, I'll send you something. And I used a lot of time to print some material and sent it over and I didn't have a reply. So I went back and it was took a lot of effort for me because I was quite shy. And also with I contacted a gallery a few. So I, I suddenly started to be more sort of extrovert, which is very necessary if you want Absolutely. to succeed. But for me, that was a hard thing. I didn't know you had to be that as an artist. I actually think I found this good place where I can just sit alone and do my drawings and have a job. But that's not how it works, you know? It's so it so pushed me out to, to that part of the job where you actually have to, you have to fight for your stuff. You have to make people aware you exist. And there's no gallerist coming knocking on your door and with a white, white horse asking you to marry him. I mean, it's not happening. Nope. And it's so and humiliating, too, to stand there. It is really hard. And, 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 and you know, I have a... <coughs> I, <laughs> I learned a lot, a couple... This isn't even that long ago, maybe three or four years ago. I made an appointment with a very famous, well-known Danish gallerist. Mm. I will not say who it is right now. And showed up at the gallery with a framed work and just kind of waved it in his face. Yes, yeah. You know, and you get that like, mm, yeah, very, very nice. Um, what do you want, actually? You know, and you're like, well, yeah, you know, I was kind of hoping that, you know, <laughs> yeah. you might, uh, you know, and they're just like, no, no, no. that's not how we do this, exactly. you know. No, no. And you just, you know, you go home and you want to throw up because it's so embarrassing. It's so hard. It's so, it's so humiliating. Hard. Yeah. You know? And you just have to. You do it again and again and yeah. again, and, and you also have to know where to do it because it doesn't exactly. There's no, you you don't have, maybe you shouldn't go to sort of the top galleries. Maybe nope. you should find out who is on, on your level, and and maybe they don't think it. Right, networking is so, so real; it's kind of crazy. Yeah, and you I'm know. not I'm not 
To be honest, I'm not very happy about networking. I like to do my studio, I like to be with good friends and colleagues, I like to travel, but I'm not very good at sort of... But stay, you stay, made stay, it work. Stay. Yeah, I did, but I think mainly by sort of contacting people where I could feel there was an interest. And, and, and right. But I'm not, because I'm not a reception kind right. of person, I'm really an... And, and if I were, maybe I would have gone further, I don't know, but you have to... But that's important too. You have to find out where you even have a chance of someone opening their ears. I think so. Yeah. Because you know, I went to a place where there was no chance of them. No, no, that's at really all stupid. looking. Yeah. And that's how I learned that lesson. You know, it's like teenage girls being in love with Justin Bieber. It's just exactly. not going to happen. Yeah. You know. And you, you look at them. You, with you better your big try eyes, to find yeah. somebody, somebody in your own classroom. Exactly. Maybe the chance will be bigger. <laughs> so. Yeah. So you know, you learn that the hard way, essentially, yeah, exactly. or I did. Um, exactly. But. Okay, so you you did you you pulled yourself together. And I you pulled made myself those together calls. and felt. I actually thought about it as suddenly. I, I think the key for me at being able to do just a little bit was thinking about it as a computer game. Mm. I was me. I had my life. I was doing my my work. But when I was taking up the phone or talking to somebody, it was a computer game, and I had sort of certain levels, certain time I could die, and right. it was not me, it was this little figure I put in the game. That's really smart, because it is a game. A uh, and that made me able to do it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it if it was myself. Right, because you can't take it personally. It's, it's my work, it's not me, and right. I think it's quite important to, and it still is for me, to, to make a distinction between my work and my person. Yeah. When I work, it's me working, but when I'm exhibit and when I show and when I speak to people about it, it's, it's my job. That's it's not right. my whole identity. Yeah. I think still I need to have this sort of secret room, which is me, and I put it in my works, but I'm not putting it out in town. Afterwards. Right, and that's a way to stay alive, because you think will so. be cut to pieces. I'm sort of a very private person in, in, in many ways, and yeah. I have to... to to survive it and I think other people are different they can sort of spread it out all out and they have enough and they don't lose it and it, I can be very envious but but I think the whole my works you can see it in my work too there is a certain privacy and it is not that right and I guess extrovert. it just comes down to you have to find your own way of working exactly. in that world if you're going exactly. to survive you know because you make a choice you say I want to make a living off of being an artist mm -hmm. which is a, you know if you look at it an extremely strange thing mm -hmm. the idea that you know, somehow you're personal because, you know, I feel like when you start making art, it's because it's a personal thing mm -hmm. coming out. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it has to be commodified and, mm -hmm. and, and worked out that way. And it's, it's, in essence, very grotesque and strange. Yeah, it is. Uh, and so you just have to find your own way of navigating. I, th I still think it's a very schizophrenic life in mm -hmm. many ways. I have to be so many persons. It's like some of these old Donald Duck stories where you have all these different hats in the yeah. same hotel. And I think it's pretty much like that. Yeah. And, and, for longer periods, I really have to sort of make out to reply on my email saying I'm out, out of office because I really have to be at the studio and concentrate and I just can't communicate a lot at, at those times where I'm entering new stages of my work. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm finished, I say, okay, now I have 14 days where I speak to people and I smile and I kiss on the cheek and I sort of go, go extrovert. And at that time, I can't do anything good at the studio. So right. it's, I have to sort of split myself up a bit to, right. to survive it. That's smart, actually. Mm. Because, I mean, you can also spend too much time communicating. Sure, and you will have nothing done. Nothing to show for it. Mm. What, um, so what happened? You know, you contacted a bunch of people. Where did the... I can't tell you. It took some time, but but um, it ended up with me having a, a small exhibition in the Demo Room in the old Aarhus Kunstmuseum. Okay. Which, which is like was the, ex, the up and coming room. The, yeah, it's the, like the experimental ex, room. Ex room yeah. in this at that time smaller museum in Aarhus but it was quite special for me because I had no CV and I know they had a lot of discussion at the museum if they could actually show an artist who was so unknown as I were and I, I was very happy they took the chance because the pr project as shown was really it was actually good I worked on it for almost three years and it was very uh, well they, um, um, it was really worked through it, it was Right. I, I was, was young, was but it was a good work. It was authentic, yeah. and, and I, so I was very happy they gave me that chance. And of course, that gave me more um, publicity than if I had did it, done it in a small artist-run gallery in a right. basement in Copenhagen, right. which was really nice. Right, and then all of a sudden, you're an artist. You yeah, know, in a so way, strange. it's a weird way. It's that... really, really strange. I always felt sort of when they, I still do when somebody wants to talk to you, you know, it's not me. 
Right. It's somebody else, <laughs> you know. It's like... Uh, oh, she's not home right now. <laughs> she, 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 actually, yeah, yeah. She, I think she's busy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So it's, and, and it started already then because it's... Yeah, I think a lot of people have that feeling. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, the, the privacy and the intimacy at the studio is compared to sort of the, the public me. There's a very big gap, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I haven't really solved it yet. Probably won't. <laughs> you don't need to, though, because yeah, you have yeah. figured out how to make it work. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But I mean, so that was your first taste of that, you know. Mm-hmm. And it is weird because you do start getting a public image, which is some sort of a hologram of mm-hmm. you. You know, and that people maybe write about you. Mm. And you're like, who are they writing about? I don't know, because like, and a lot of the time I couldn't recognize what they wrote. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, what, what is this? Yeah, because it was also a strange time. I did drawings, and, and, and at first I thought it wasn't art, really, drawings. But suddenly, luckily for me, some other people thought it was. And, mm-hmm. and suddenly it went really, it all went very quick, because the economy was boosting at that time. That was sort of in the... When was it? 2003. Right I had this exhibition, boom. and suddenly there was a boom. And there were so many galleries opening, and everybody wanted to buy art because now they bought the kitchen and the oh. new bathroom. So I got into that sort of stream too. Had, had to use that bank loan. Yeah, which was pretty crazy too. It was wild. That's when I moved here. I moved here yeah. when when yeah. Uh, when it was kind of. I don't know if it was peaking or just starting to go down, but there was out in uh, Valby, there was that big mm-hmm. building with mm-hmm. Mogadishu. Mm-hmm. Mogadishu, how are those called? Yes, yes. Um, and all those galleries mm-hmm. out there. And then like a year and a half later, boom, Because I, all gone. I, I was a part of that scene and I was, I think, pretty unprepared yeah, for yeah. all that happened. I had, everything had been quiet for 10 years <laughs> and I've been the nerd in the corner with my little pen right. being afraid to go to exhibitions and suddenly right. it all just went... <laughs> Right. And all these stupid women's magazine wanted to speak to me about what I was reading and what I was eating and where I was drinking my coffee. It was just, <laughs> it was really crazy. But on the um, other hand, you could quit your job and you could start I could quit my job and and, and, and and I learned a lot from it. Mm-hmm. Also to say no and to find out where, how to navigate in that sort of public field. Because that's the dream, right? You know, even though you're not prepared for it, it's what you want. It's what I want. And then again, you have to sort of control it yourself after a while. Right. Uh, but it was it was wonderful to be able to stop working at the post, and also I got my daughter then. So if I had to be a mother and work at the post and do my art, it probably would have been pretty bad for my art as well. Right. So it's so hard. so yeah. to do those three things, I think, is almost almost impossible. And I have a very big admiration for people who kept keep on. It's a lot of work. Exactly. What. Um what happened with, during, after the collapse? You know, because the gallery you worked with closed. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and that's where I actually saw your work first was at mm-hmm. that gallery. But they closed uh, pretty mm-hmm. spectacularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, there mm-hmm. was a big boom, and then mm-hmm. they were gone. Uh, um, and you didn't find it. You you were in you were in a position where you could sell your own artwork, right? It was all pretty weird because I, I stopped working at the gallery. I think half a year before he. Uh, he oh stopped. right, he was yeah. I remember. Uh, and, and never mind, we had a very good sort of relationship for a while, and then it all went crazy. Yeah. And that's just another story. Um, and I think I really, as an even though the gallery didn't stop, I really needed time to to think because I was I was very happy and very lucky and very sort of grateful that I could make a living from my art. At the same time, it was very confusing for me to, to have phone calls from Ikea or furniture mag- magazines who wanted to interview me and know what I was reading and they wanted to come home and see my clothes. I mean, God, they would have been disappointed. So, so this sort of lifestyle thing which went into art made me sick because I hate that. I never read women's magazine. I, I mean, I, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in capitalism. And suddenly you see yourself as a wheel in something that you actually really despise. Right, and, and that was that was too. really confusing. At one time, I was grateful, and at the same time, I was throwing up yeah. to be a part of something that I really don't like. I don't like. I mean, I don't believe in buying a lot of stuff. I don't believe in that shit. Yeah. And suddenly, you get sort of prestige object for people who are told that that's what might make them happy. Right. Well, it becomes <laughs> um, decorative in a weird way, too. It mm-hmm. takes out any meaning the work exactly. had. Exactly. And, and contextualizes it in this, oh, well, you know... And journalists asked this. me about my uh, about what, what I was earning, and people thought I earned a lot of money, and it was all about what the price of the artwork was, not about 
the yeah. artwork. So I, I, in many ways, it was very convenient for me that it all sort of collapsed because I, I was. <laughs> it was a good time to ask yourself what you wanted. And what exactly. Was going on. So so and, and I didn't. It took quite a while before I started to to look for a new gallery. I really needed time to yeah. again to close the door and find out what I wanted and and what I thought. Well, in the meantime, you started you you had the show at Aros, right? Yeah, because then then I had this. Um, I really wanted to do something else. I wanted to have time, and I made an agreement with ours and a fantastic museum in Sweden called the Nordic Watercolor Museum and a museum in Finland, Turku, that I would make a big show touring for these three places. Did you do that on your own? Uh, no, I actually the Watercolor Museum that arrangement was made before okay. I stopped with Muka Disney and he helped a bit so I had to sort of make an agreement with him to, to stop working with him uh-huh. and Turku contacted me and, and ours I contacted ours because I wanted to hear if they would do something again bigger, uh-huh. which they luckily did and it was a big show it was quite a big show yes uh-huh. And then I had two years where I was actually working for this show. I was exhibiting a bit, sort of visiting in, in galleries in Copenhagen that I had a good connection with, but not starting to... Or just staying visible, kind of. Just being way. a visitor was, yeah. was fine. And I worked with a gallery in London for a while until I actually quit that too, because I thought there was just too much to talk about money issues. And, and they had a hard time too because of the financial oh, crisis. So yeah. I just wanted to... To be, I think, single for a while in the art scene, which was break up with all your art which was boyfriends. pretty hard, but very good too. I right. learned so much from that. Right. Also, a lot about how how hard it is to be a gallerist too, because it's also it's a strange relationship where artists often just ask the gallery to do everything, and and they can't. Sure. It's not that easy. Sure. Well, they're not exactly so getting rich either. The it's very them. much a special about I think balancing the ex- expectations from both sides. Yeah. Well, it also makes it when you come back. To that world, you're mm-hmm. from such a stronger, more experienced mm-hmm. position. Mm-hmm. You know more what to expect, how to mm-hmm. navigate, exactly. uh, all that sort of stuff. I mean, um, but so you, I mean, that's the thing. You were kind of, you weren't gone, but you were kind of on your own there for a while, and then you had this huge show in Aarhus, yes, and yes. Aarhus. That must have been kind of spectacular too. It was very, very great to be able to. I did a lot of new works, but I also choose older works, mm-hmm. and again to. Um, to collect all these works and to show them in the way I want them to be shown. Nice. In, instead of tree works in an art fair somewhere and something in the gallery, I could actually take in the works I wanted and, and show them, say, here, this is how it's supposed to be. Right, and you made was, large was works great. too, right? I made large works and, I, again, I installed the rooms and, and made them... made an, a sort of a whole experience instead of a few works, which right. was really nice because... I really like this sort of kind of movie feeling when you when you walk into to the rooms and see see my works. I think it suits my work very well. Mm-hmm. Makes it kind of a yeah more of an experience than just. It's, a, I think the sort of institutional feel you get from museums can be. I don't know. It makes such a distance that I don't like that much. So yeah. so trying to pull that down was was great. Yeah. Um, and then what after that you. Uh, you started kind of coming out again into the gallery world. Yeah, I started. I had some conversation with people quite, and and I, yeah, talked to it, and and I liked that sort of. They're they're just very easy going, which was really nice. They are. I, I needed They've been to really nice to us. I show. needed to work with a gallery that didn't um, own me, yeah. <laughs> in that sort of really hardcore way I tried before. Right. At the same time, I still have to do a lot of work, but I think most art- artists do. But it's sort of well, it's easy going. It's just the nature of it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but they are very nice, and they are. I don't know how I can say I didn't need need new parents. <laughs> I tried it once. I moved from home, and I didn't need. Right, but it's also so, about so, maturing. So that yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, and now you're just you know now you you have a big show at uh, at Gamma mm-hmm. Uh You survived yet again. Yes. <laughs> and so is it time again to sit back? And yeah, I think so. I, I'm, I'm very much into doing this sort of kind of installation thing. And I have this idea, I don't know if it's going to work out, that it would be interesting to make a show where the works are actually almost not existing. I would like to... So the installation overpowers the works? Yeah, I would like to, to work with both, at yeah. least, yes. And 
are thinking about maybe trying to do some kind of animation too, mm-hmm. but not not in a narrative sense, but but just make like a wallpaper moving or something we would be would be interesting. But but still based on drawings, definitely. Right. Yeah. I saw the uh, the trailer for the film yes, that was about yes. you and how the, it was animated, some of the drawings. And it could be fun to work with that in a sort of more specific way where right. it gets the work itself. Maybe. I have, I have a lot of ideas and they're not... The, the dots are not connected yet, to be honest. Sure, but just having <laughs> And I just to needed it to be open for a while and see what's happening. And then I have to do some... I have some smaller shows and I have to do some work for them too. But, but I would like to do something maybe a bit more experimental as well. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, it's nice that you're that you're working on, on on expanding and constantly kind of trying to make it different and better. But I'm also kind of interested in the work. You know, it's mm-hmm. so it's hard for me to describe in a way because for me, it's it's some sort of like um, reality bending children's book fairy tale mm-hmm. stories that you're telling, but they're without narrative. You know, they're very mm-hmm. open ended. Mm-hmm. You know, and like you're like, what does a kitten mean to you? You know, a what kitten. is it? Yeah, a kitten or a doll, or you know, you have these reoccurring symbols or or uh, figures which keep coming back. It's not. I don't work in a symbolic sense like that. That a kitten means a certain thing, and a helicopter means a certain thing. I'm just really interested in this. How can I say it? Sort of base we all got for things that we just take for granted. Clichés like the children's room, the idea of innocence, the idea of cuteness—all these things that that are so grounded, hmm. right? In, in our perception, at least for us, exactly. And, and to take them and use them and squeeze them around and pull them apart and put them together again—I think it's just, yeah, for me, it's just interesting to 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 question our notion of reality by taking these sort of really cliché kind of thing right so, but you do and also, it's also, I also use emotions a lot I mean I take mm-hmm. things we have a certain emotional attachment to and in and, and that way I'm sort of very cheap you can say because it's almost like crying children I, but it, it works you know I take things that we that we have this sort of certain maybe very banal relation to and then and put them in in new ways to see reality in a new way yeah I think. Well, I mean, I, you know, it's not it's not important that you do it. It's important how you do it. You mm-hmm. know, so mm-hmm. yeah, you mm-hmm. you say maybe there's a chance that it's that it's banal, but I think it's more the way you do it and the way you inject in a weird way good and evil into mm-hmm. these mm-hmm. symbols mm-hmm. and 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 creepy and mm-hmm. sweet mm-hmm. and you know, mm-hmm. there's this constant weird interplay between you know, here's a doll which is a very sweet and you know. Childhood and childhood often is 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 good memories mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. safety and protection. Mm-hmm. But then the doll has this look in its face, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you know, or the face is not even there. You've mm-hmm. got these big whited out areas mm-hmm. or blacked mm-hmm. out areas. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what what what's that? What's the blocked out part? You know, because you'll leave big spaces blank or. I mean, faces in general, off. I just really like to screw our expectations, like what what we expect mm. to happen. And, and and when I work, it's it's a little bit like playing playing chess with myself. If if I have this sort of like if the innocent part or the sweet part gets too takes out too much space, I have to do a counter part somewhere and, and do something else which makes it scary. And if it's too scary and too sweet, I have to put something in which is extremely stupid <laughs> and, and funny. So it's so it's always I, I'm very sad if if a picture. It's just one thing or two things. It mm-hmm. should hopefully sort of all the time be erasing what I just said. Be multidimensional. Exactly. And, and maybe f- first it's like here is something cruel and something sweet together. But if you look a little bit closer, there will be a stupid little bird with a scarf in the corner, which is neither. I love that bird. So it's like, you know, it's, it's, I really like the confusion of... Um, how do you say it? When people see my work, always, they always want an explanation, or they give me an explanation. But but I really want this open end at the same time as I like to trick people to need to explain. We really want to understand, we really want to explain. And when I use these sort of very well-known figures, I think it really tricks that thing in our brain that we want to comprehend this. We right. want to come up with an explanation and and and... 
be able to say what it is about. But there's always, I try to have a, a little open end where it's not really that possible. If you look a little bit closer, it all it falls apart. Right. That explanation didn't fulfill it anyway. Right. And the blank part is, of course, the, the nothingness or where it's not finished and it's showing again that it's all an illusion because it's, it's anyway, it's just something on a piece of paper. Do you have a desire to mess it up if it's too perfect? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's it's a mixture. I like it. I like the sort of for food and mm. uh, that it leads you places. That it, yeah, uh, I like the, the because they're very beautiful and people can relate to that. And there's a lot of ornament, and you get sort of dragged in, and the ch- children are very beautiful and all that. But but there should definitely be something that disturbs it. Mm-hmm. But I'm also very aware that I'm using this. I'm f- making these very fine drawings to to make it look. Um, very innocent and, and easy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can say a lot of people can relate to my work, so I try to make the disturbance sort of be underneath the table to grab them from underneath. I don't know if well, they it have makes very, any sense. It does, because, you know, it is, it's exactly right what you're saying, because mm. you have a very, well, I can only speak for myself, I have a very strong visceral reaction to them. Mm. They draw me in, mm. they're ornate, they're delicate. I try to be very seductive in, in the way I draw it. They're very and seductive. then when people get in, hopefully they, they, they get something else well, with them out. There's an emotional underlayer um, to it. Yes, and yes. you leave that open. There isn't a clear message or emotion to it, but you can just feel that there is emotion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, do you put that... Per- is that is that personal? Is that your emotion? I, it's with? very much a mixed. Yeah, Sometimes I think when I work, I really have to sort of build up some kind of emotions in myself. I guess it's a bit like method acting. Yeah. Uh, it's not that I'm thinking about a certain episode from my childhood or a bad morning. It's much, way more abstract. But Just I really try, to, try to, to tap into something which is filled up with emotion. Mm-hmm. And I definitely work with that. But I'm also working in a very... Um, maybe... A, so it's that mixed with a... A way away where I think I know this thing works like this on the viewer. I mean, eyes. I use a lot of eyes, and that's very easy because eyes drags you in. That's the first thing you look at. Right. So it's a mixture b- between playing with people's brain in a very uh, bewitched, deliberate way, deliberate, yeah. and then using my own emotions, which I don't even know myself. So right. It's, uh, but just tapping into something. Ex- exactly. Do you? Um do you use a lot of resources, or is it all just... Oh, a lot. Like, you've got cutouts, and you've got My whole studio is full of what looks like, I don't know what, full of clip-outs and prints and... Okay, yeah. so you so can I open a magazine them. and see something and say, oh, that's Very an interesting much. And thing. And I buy a lot of books with patterns and wallpapers from different times and mm-hmm. in in history, yes. So Victorian architecture or All Victorian? kinds of things, yes. Yes, I use a lot of books and I... Now, of course, the internet as well. I do a lot of prints. Right. All the family members on, on the show now is is people I don't know, but it's people I have sort of downloaded from the internet or found in other people's um, photo books. It's not my own family. It's, mm. it's people I don't know, but, but they're made out from real people. And then I, like Dr. Frankenstein, maybe take the eyes from one father and the hair from another and invent my own shirt. So I sort of... Well, it's nice about that. Ma- make my own family and, right. and and invent these identities, but but based on people who does live out there somewhere. Right, real people with yes. real lives and stories. Yeah. What's nice about it is you does that's uh, not a part of the final product. It's your process for making it, but I can't see as the viewer that the hair. It, it, there's no Frankensteinness over it. No, it feels no, like a no. whole work, yeah. and these are just the tidbits of your reference mm-hmm. points and mm-hmm. everything. Um, I hope you do make a children's book one day. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It's such a strange format, I know, and it's so like deliberate in terms of where, who it's for, and everything. But yeah, I don't mind it being for children. I'm, I get asked quite often to illustrate things, but mm-hmm. uh, but I can't. I mean, I would. It's not that I, I have anything against it or think it's uncool, but but as soon as somebody gives me a story, I just freeze, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> right, Maybe well, one because day. you don't tell stories. You I don't tell, tell stories. I tell, tell fragments of stories. Right. I tell sort of open ends and and moments in the movie, I don't know. Right. So, so to suddenly get a story, I, I, it's, it's impossible for me. So I don't know if I could do it myself either. Right. Um, well, I mean, obviously you've always 
found your place of making art inside of you and nowhere else. Yeah, but but, but maybe it could change too. I don't know. But at the moment, uh, um, I have said yes a few times where I just have to go back and say, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. So mm. we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think it'll be... It'll, it'll be nice to see the direction you take it. And I really like the idea you're talking about of getting more into installation. And I mean installation in the nice way, not the not nice way, you know, because people it's, get it's, tired when they hear the word installation. Oh, no. I know. Like, I, oh. think it's, I think it's a very, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's, it's not supposed to be an excuse for doing actually traditional works. Right. And then it's a problem. If you do some works and you frame them and it's just basically quite traditionally and then you have to do some sound and light show to make it modern it's it's pretty bad (laughs) so it should of course be supposed to be like that Uh i will still make works on a white wall it's not that i'm against it at all i just i'm just curious about this idea of letting people into my work that's actually what i would like to do instead of drawing a room on a on a on a piece of paper then to make people to enter that room and that feel and those sounds that I think are in the picture to see if that's possible or if I'm just overdoing it I don't know yet that's sort of the whole experiment I think because there's also something really nice about seeing a drawing and, and nothing else yeah I mean I mean, you mentioned earlier that you have to keep your work you know you were talking about how it's hard to compete with masculine large mm-hmm. works mm-hmm. you know but you don't need to compete no. That's the whole no, point. No, you just no. need to do what you do well and bring people in. And so, uh, you know, when you have an art show in a space that isn't yours, you lose some control mm-hmm. over how that experience mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. So gaining back some of the control, mm-hmm. I think, can only help the work. Yeah, so do I. In that case, you know, and there's lots of opportunities and to see And also like the, the idea the of actually entering the room to take it over where as an artist you are... You change all the time depending on what curators show you, what what is the attitude of the gallery, what is the identity of this museum. And of course it's like that, and you should be open p- for that. But at the same time, it's really nice to sort of... to rule it, yeah. <laughs> I think, to take right. it in, to overrule it, to make right. it yours. And, and I love the idea of walking around in the museum, at the museum's floor, and suddenly, like in Olbo, you just go into a different place. Suddenly there's this sort of yellow brick wall and you go into a carpet and there's different sound and you change you can see it when people enter that they change their position with the body they suddenly change they look different and they're not at the museum anymore they're in this non-space between my exhibition and then something they relate to maybe their own childhood right. house and and i really like to, to trick that i like to sort of overrule the museums is it just a little bit less. right and I mean and you have to remember that, that an art museum essentially at its base is entertainment you go there to entertain yourself mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. Uh, with artwork mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. I mean it is no different than an aquarium in some weird way no no I you know, know I know that, that's an arguable point but that is basically mm-hmm. what it is so mm-hmm. by creating an experience you're entertaining the audience mm-hmm. uh, as base as that sounds do you go to a lot of art shows? Do you see other people's art? Are you? Uh, I would involved? like to do it a lot more, but that's only a question of time. It's not a question about that. I don't want to. I think it's really important to see art. Preferably, I would like to travel more and see art other places too, because it can be very local if it's just walking around to friends' exhibitions in Copenhagen. Mm-hmm. It's but but sort of. So you are engaged. You do pay attention to what other people are yes, doing. Yes, not not as much as I would love to, but I hope I'll get more time. But, right. Mm. Well, I mean that's just how it is, you know. Mm. Um, but I mean that's also exactly the point of this show. Mm. We want to create something in which uh, that discussion can come home. Mm-hmm. You know, and you can you can listen to this or you know anything like it, and be part of some sort of conversation without having to actually be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? <gasps> Um, so you got maybe a show coming up at V1 next, or it's kind of up in the air? Yeah, probably sooner or later, but I would, again, like to do something else too, but it's still very open, and maybe to collaborate with a, with with other artists would be quite nice too, I think, I'm sort of, hmm. because I'm very sort of lonely in the way I work, and, and I am, I think, pretty much sort of an this weird woman and I'm out doing my stuff with my little pen for years and years and years and, and doing this show at Olbo and Gammelstein I really like to work with the composer and 
I work with a graphic designer too about the wallpapers and, and it's nice to to involve other people too because it pushed me too and I think I need that for a while to, to sort of lose control a bit mm -hmm. would be quite to get good. ripped out of the safe area I think so yeah well yeah you built this up for yourself in order to function and now mm -hmm. it's time to push the walls out maybe a little bit yeah I think so but when you say collaborate you mean enlist help to create your vision right? I'm not sure yet it's still still very open so I can't really really say no right. I think I can't see myself doing a, a drawing with another person right. with, I don't know it could be fun but I don't really believe in that it's hard to find a reason for it. Exactly. You know, like, exactly. what does this mean? Why exactly. is this different exactly. than just one person? No, but, but to, to, to find some artists that I think I can relate to and to, to don't know, maybe maybe make make a show where we do each our room, but, but where there is a collaboration anyway. Right. I think so. But also I would like to work more with sounds and, and wallpapers. I, I don't know, but I'm sort of quite open for, for doing other things than only doing my drawings at the studio. Hmm. But I mean, just having the space and the time to do that, mm -hmm. that's worth everything, you know. Mm -hmm. That's why why you worked so hard to get to where you are, mm -hmm. you know. It gives you that space and freedom to do it. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> two months <laughs> ahead, honestly. <laughs> but do you true. feel, wait, does it feel insecure to you, being an artist? Does it feel oh, yeah, like it does, definitely. Like, yeah, yeah, I don't no, know, my, maybe tomorrow no one my, will care my, my production is not that big, so even if I sell everything I do, I can, I can hardly. So I, I have a family, and my husband is uh, studying still, which mm. is great because you have more time with the family than <laughs> I don't in periods. But, but it's not that. I don't know. I think you, you really have to. I don't have that big industry going, so it's right. still, I don't know. It's like if, if I can see three months ahead, I'm sort of really... It's good. Right. Right. But I know, I mean, I have a name of some kind, so it's so it's not as unsecure as I know it is for a lot of my colleagues, and I'm very grateful for that, but but well, I have no... one step at a time. I right? have no... Well, uh, no pension. Of, I have no pension, and I have no sort oh, of... Oh, So in that does. way, no. <laughs> why? You know, so it's uh, not... It's not that subtle, honestly. Right. Yeah. But but I would like to do these sort of more experimental things, and that's hard because you, you don't probably won't sell it, and maybe it's just going to end up being really bad. But I think it's important to to take chance, and even even if you are established, even that word is really bad somehow, isn't it? it sounds like it's a dead. <laughs> so, right. but I mean so, that's so, the reality of it. That is the reality of working as exactly. An so, and, so so I have to also think. Okay, I also do have to make some good works because that's yeah. what pay my rent. Sure, making. But, Weird wallpapers doesn't, you know? It's, um... Or illustrations for somebody. No. But do you... I mean, you don't have to do something experimental in Denmark. No, nobody you... tells me. It's just my myself. I, I think it's important for yourself, at least for me, to to, to push it a little bit each time. Mm -hmm. I just got really tired of making small works for right. art fairs. Right. It's great now and then, but, but if that's... All I do, I sort of, I think I'll die <laughs> in the end, you know? Well, I think what, you know, the fact that you know that and mm -hmm. have that feeling, mm -hmm. to me, means you're going to be fine. I think so, because I like to do small work. I just have to, if it's all the same, it doesn't matter whether you're an artist right. or and not. And that's, just, how, you that's just how people lose die. interest in you, yeah. by doing it all mm -hmm. the same, mm -hmm. you know? So as long as you keep having that desire to to push the boundaries mm -hmm. of what you do and mm -hmm. move out into new territories, mm -hmm. you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. That can be your pension. New new, new areas. Yeah, never, who knows anyway about tomorrow. <laughs> you can always <laughs> retire in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for letting me be here. All right, was that nice or was that nice? I was pleasantly surprised by Julie. She was really open and willing to come in and talk to me. You know, she talks about, you know, coming from kind of a background of having a social phobia and not really wanting to talk or network or any of that. But uh, she really was uh, was nothing but open and uh, welcoming, which I thought was great. Obviously, she said a lot of really interesting things. I think one of the most useful things, actually, that really stuck with me is the idea that you can make the unpleasant parts of networking and trying to make your work visible out in the world, you can make that into a computer game. 
you can, you know, just abstract enough. And it goes into the idea of having this secret room, too. You've got your business side, and you've got your work side, or your art side, or even your private life, which doesn't touch any of it. All these things are important elements to the whole package, but you have to learn how to take each one for what it is and not let it infect the other parts. You have to wear a lot of hats these days. You have to be able to play many roles in this game. And so you have to learn how to compartmentalize these things to kind of, you know, to grow into some sort of transformer monster of, 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 you know, complete artistic ability, both business and production and time management and, uh, you know, boozing without boozing too much and all those things that make a good transformer robot. I guess that was too far, but, but yeah, I mean, this is one of those talks I think you can probably listen to twice because there's a lot of really good nuggets of wisdom in there about how to deal with, uh, with being in the art world and, uh, you know, having to escape and come back and reevaluate and making decisions based off of what you do and do not want to do. There's so much to bite into there. So yeah, don't be afraid to listen to it twice. I already did, and I got a lot out of it. All right, summer vacation is soon upon us. We're not taking any time off, as far as we know. We got a couple of great episodes coming up. I managed to talk my boss into four weeks of vacation from my job, so I'm going to print an edition in the dark room. going to work on the podcast. We're expecting new equipment. All sorts of good stuff. And we got a filmmaker friend coming into town in the next two weeks. Should be pretty exciting. But I think that about wraps it up today. I want to thank you guys for listening. I want to welcome the new people once again. And I want to say, let's meet again next week. This week's show produced by The Under Gang once again. Intro and outro music provided kindly by MGT Beats. Link to MGT Beats on our About page. Interstitial music provided once again kindly by R.C. A-R-S-Y. You can find a link to him on the show notes page for this episode. We've been tooling around with our website. It's looking better than ever. Please go check it out, undergang.net. And please keep the emails coming too. Tell us what you think. Give a vote on the intro and outro music. Really, please give a vote on the intro and outro music. Your vote could be the deciding one. You hold the fate of our intro and outro music in your hands. Send us a mail. Holler at undergang.net. H-O-L-L-E-R. You can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. We would greatly appreciate it if you wrote a little review, gave us a, uh, you know, clicked a couple of stars there, whatever you think. It helps other people find the show. It helps spread the word. And you can find us on Twitter. We are The Undergang on Twitter. Check it out. We're loving all the information you can find on Twitter. It's, it's, you know, it's just so much better than Facebook. That's all we got to say about that. Cool, guys. Stay tuned. Be sure to tell your friends and enemies about this show, and we'll catch you next week. <laughs>